Hi guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. All right, thank you for joining me today. Please subscribe, please hit the bell for notifications. This allows me to provide you guys free content. Okay, so today we have Elliot Overton with us. He is all things holistic nutrition and we take a deep dive on oxalates. We also talk deeply about supplementation and why we sometimes may need support even from a carnivore diet perspective. All right guys, let's get right into it. Um, he was a pleasure and I hope you guys learn a ton. Make sure to get your pen and paper out this time. There are a ton of notes that you can take. Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy and today I'm very excited. I have Elliot Overton with me and we are going to talk about all things holistic nutrition, oxalates, sleeping, and so let's get right into it. Elliot, thank you so much for joining me today. If you can sort of introduce yourself and what got you interested in holistic nutrition. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, I, uh, I guess I like science. I'm interested in science. I like chemistry. I like biochemistry, particularly interested in nutritional biochemistry and how that applies to um, human health. And I think that the conventional medical standpoint, um, generally treating symptoms, tends to neglect uh, in individual human biochemistry and how, how, how individuals differ and how actually by pinpointing um, nuances in, in our biochemistry, we can potentially uh see much better results in in yeah. human health if that makes sense so so i just a bit of background i um i went traveling through uh india i went there for about a year and i um i developed quite severe gut issues digestive issues it was like a bacterial gastroenteritis or something mm -hmm. and um I came back to the uk and i went to my doctor and i went through kind of the general recommendations and the conventional recommendations and uh, and I saw almost no benefit. I was essentially told that I'd just have to deal with this, what was now post-infectious IBS. Um, and so that kind of spurred me on to researching alternative methods, so alternative supplements and probiotics and diets and these kinds of things. But this eventually led me on to uh, Weston A. Price Foundation and then down that route towards like a ketogenic low carb kind of template and i found that that actually really helped it didn't completely fix it but it you know essentially got got me to a point where i was no longer having severe digestive issues um and so you know i've always been kind of interested in medicine in herbal medicine these kinds of things but i decided kind of early on that i didn't want to go the conventional medical route um because you know, particularly in the UK, but I know it's the case in the US as well, um, that, you know, people are getting sicker and sicker. Generally, yeah. you know, whatever they're doing, the conventional recommendations don't work. So actually, uh, you know, I wanted to I had fairly good confidence in the, the power of nutrition in, a, in its ability to kind of, um, you know, really help people. Uh, deal with chronic illnesses you know conventional medicine is amazing if you break your arm or if you kind of have some acute infection but actually otherwise you know for chronic long-term illnesses then it doesn't have a great track record and so um yeah i i kind of decided i wanted to study nutrition and i had a couple of options i could have gone down the conventional university route um but that was very much many of the courses where i was looking anyway at the universities very much kind of focused on the traditional food pyramid the fda food pyramid and that was what i was trying to kind of work yeah. away from you know I, I lost faith in that so i um i went a bit of an alternative route I, I went to somewhere called the college of naturopathic medicine i got my nutritional therapy diploma and um since that point i've i've kind of been studying um learning and trying to apply what i've learned um again I, anyone who studies nutrition in any detail will understand quickly on that there's many biases and it's you know we all have our biases but actually there's lots of different schools of thought and yeah. it's kind of trying to separate the wheat from the chaff and find out what works and what doesn't work and it doesn't always apply to you know one thing doesn't always apply to everyone right yeah. so it's trying to pick out the principles that, that generally can be applied to most people and then tease out the nuances 
Um, and so, yeah, that's what I do. So I work with people on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, most of my practice is virtual. So it's primarily I work with people from all around the world. Um, and we kind of go through their health and, and try to refine their diet and their lifestyle. And, um, yeah, basically help them feel better again kind of thing. Yeah, no, that's very similar to what I do. And it's, um, I mean, it's amazing. It's, uh, we can have sort of a theory in our mind of what works with nutrition. And then we work with someone else. And it's like, okay, that's not really working. And then we have to get back down to the bio individuality of what makes sense for that specific person. So I totally on the same page with you. And it's very exciting, right? Um, so let's transition to talking a little bit about oxalates. I heard you on, I think, a couple podcasts where you talk about oxalates. And if you can sort of just give a you know, a brief explanation about what oxalates are. Yeah, of course. Um, am I right in thinking that you've had Sally Norton on the show previously? Yeah, so your listeners are probably familiar with it, but I'll go through the basics just in case there's anyone sure. listening that aren't familiar with it. So <clears throat> essentially there's this idea, um, just to kind of go back, this kind of central uh, nutritional dogma um, which persists in conventional medicine, but also in nutritional circles as well. And it's particularly common in today's world coming from the, um, let's say, the, the mainstream sources or official sources, this idea that plants are fundamentally healthy um, mm. and they are benign, right? And that the more plants that you eat, the, the, the healthier you will become. Um, but there's there's many problems with that kind of theory um, and and many nuances, but ultimately there's this, concept of, of plant toxicity that is often overlooked so uh, in regard to in kind of alternative health circles uh, naturopathic health circles these kinds of things it's well acknowledged that you have something like uh, gluten which can cause problems so gluten uh, protein found in wheat um, that can cause many problems for a variety of people um, in terms of irritating the gut in terms of kind of there's links with autoimmunity so it's well established that the gliadin and the gluten found in the wheat can can cause problems so we know that there are certain plants or certain grains that can exert um detrimental effects on the human body and and of course that's very individual but when you go down that rabbit hole it doesn't really end so so ultimately there are a variety of other toxins ultimately we we have this we have gluten so or gliadin which is part of the lectin family and we also have many different other types of lectins, which are found in a wide variety of kind of foods. Um, but then we also have uh, several other toxins which have the capability to cause the human body problems, especially if the gut is not in a good place. If the gut is kind of if we have underlying intestinal permeability or leaky gut, which your listeners are probably familiar with, then it can render someone a little bit more susceptible to these types of toxins so aside from lectins aside from the other things that we find in grains one of the the primary toxins that we find in plants is called oxalate so oxalate is uh, it's essentially an organic acid it exists in many different plants um and it's exists in higher quantities in certain plants than other plants um and essentially it's theorized by certain kind of plant researchers that it might be a um it might be like a defense mechanism employed by plants um, again, there's this concept that you listeners are probably familiar with, but just in case they're not, this this idea that actually every living organism, and that includes plants, that includes animals and human beings and everything in between kind of thing, um, everything wants to survive, right? And so everything has its own uh, mechanism or its own kind of tools by which it can survive in a kind of treacherous world. And um, and so like animals or human beings, we have legs, we have arms, we can build tools. Um, animals, uh, plants don't have that. Plants can't run away from 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 people or from predators or from herbivores. And so what they will do instead is they can release certain chemicals and they do this. So they're operating on a biochemical front to basically send a signal to whoever or whatever animal is eating that that it's probably not a good idea to do that in a you know for too long because they can cause problems so oxalate is theorized to be one of these potential mechanisms it's essentially i said it was an organic acid but basically it, what it is it's a chemical which can bind very tightly to certain minerals so mm -hmm. it binds tightly to calcium it binds tightly to magnesium potassium other minerals to strong chelator think of it a bit like a magnet and in a plant it can exist in various different forms but what you find is you find uh, when it's bound with calcium it forms these kind of crystals or 
sharp needle like structures so if you look at a, an oxalate crystal under a microscope there's various different kinds of structures that it can exist in but essentially it is capable of doing severe mechanical damage to um, an organism which consumes it so if you look if you think of um I mean, some of the plants which contain very high levels of oxalate, particularly spinach. Okay, so spinach is very high. Rhubarb is very high. Um, we have kind of dark chocolate or raw cacao that's extraordinarily high. Certain types of tea, so black tea, green tea. Um, we have <clears throat> other plants, including Swiss chard, including um, sweet potato, including potato, white potato. There's 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 a long list of plants which contain the, the this this toxin in 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 varying different degrees um but essentially um there are also some plants which don't contain much of it so it's not saying that all plants have this toxin but we have to kind of distinguish and so the way that this toxin is basically operating in the human body is that when we consume too many of these plants the way it becomes problematic is that we can we 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 absorb this oxalate and we can actually accumulate it so over a long period of time when someone eats a, a diet which is very high in these types of plants say if they're on a traditional kind of ketogenic diet which is heavy in plant foods if they're on a vegan diet or even just like a standard western diet which is high in these foods um, essentially what we find is that actually the body over long periods of time especially if there's a susceptibility if they've got poor gut health if there's various other things going on then essentially the body will accumulate this and what is happening is, is that when we are eating a food containing oxalate we're breaking that down in the gut and all throughout the gi tract depending on the form of the oxalate so you have oxalate uh, soluble oxalate or insoluble oxalate so the soluble forms of oxalate are going to be absorbed right throughout the gi tract all through um you know in in the soft tissues in the mouth through the esophagus in the stomach in the small intestine the large intestine so you're going to get the passage of this crystal or this kind of um yeah, this chemical structure through into into the bloodstream and it travels through the blood. And when it's traveling through the blood um, here, because your minerals, if you recall me saying that it is a chelator, mineral chelator, then because your blood is packed full of minerals and your tissues are packed full of minerals, essentially what's happening is, is that it's forming a, it can form a, if it comes into contact with a certain mineral such as calcium, it can basically precipitate out of the blood into a tissue and form into somewhat of a crystal or a stone. And so oftentimes what happens is, is that these crystals can deposit in the joints or the muscles, or they may deposit in uh, various other organs. They can deposit throughout the vascular system. And when they do, you can essentially think of it <clears throat> in an oversimplified very kind of oversimplified way is, is if someone basically got a very small shard of glass kind of stab that in your tissue and that could be in the vascular system it could be in the muscle as i said it could be many people have it in the thyroid gland there's there's a couple of studies showing that you know uh, i think there was one study in adults over 50 or over 60 showing that up to 80 percent of of them actually had significant calcium oxalate deposits in the thyroid gland wow. and and this so this is is very common right and and if you ask any kind of conventional doctor or any conventional dietitian about calcium oxalate they will generally think that it is only a concern in relation to cal uh, in, in relation to the disease kidney stones so so that is kind of the characteristic disease that calcium oxalate is associated with and has been associated with in the clinical literature anyway so most of or around 80 percent of all kidney stones are actually composed of calcium oxalate and so when someone does develop kidney stones what that is essentially what that means or what is causing that most of the time is generally high levels of oxalate circulating around the blood being passed out the kidneys because the kidneys is one of the main ways that we're getting rid of it yes um essentially it's precipitating with calcium and then it's forming into a stone that, that, that is not being passed through the through the the urinary tract so that is one of the main diseases that oxalate can cause but what isn't very well acknowledged uh it's getting a lot more attention now is that actually there's a wide body of literature showing that actually there are calcium oxalate can be involved in many different types of diseases or pathologies 
but it's not necessarily identified as a causal factor. Sometimes what they'll do, for instance, I mean, there's a couple of papers showing that breast cancer, for instance, mm -hmm. Calcium oxalate may be evolved in breast cancer. So actually what they found is, is that actually um, in, in certain cases of breast cancer, there is significant calcium oxalate deposits in the breast tissue. Same thing goes for something like um, uh, uh, ovarian cancer, other types of cancers. But what this stuff is doing is that when the body is accumulating it, say because there is like a high body burden of this, <clears throat> then essentially um, it, it's not a benign thing, right? It's not just that you are kind of you're 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 accumulating in tissue and it's not really doing anything that's that's not what's happening it's causing a lot of damage when it's in your body right so when the body accumulates this when it's say you've got it in the joints it can produce a, a condition which is actually referred to as oxalate induced arthropathy or oxalate related arthropathy i believe and that that is basically a condition which mimics it mimics almost every single symptom of arthritis right mm. but it's not arthritis the immune system is not attacking the joints what's happening is, is you have these crystals lodged in the joints and every time the joint moves you think about it if you've got this sharp structure lodged in the connective tissue whenever you move that or whenever you put any kind of pressure on that that is going to cause stress that's going to cause damage it causes mechanical damage to the tissue so it can actually cause an inflammatory response this is what you see actually wherever it's deposited it is activating the immune system consistently right but you also have not only do you have these kind of large macromolecules or large crystals kind of thing you also have very small types of oxalate as well. So you have these things called nanocrystals or um, microcrystals. And what they can do, they're particularly uh, dangerous, really, because what they do is they're not only extracellular, they are intracellular. So they can get into cells. You see, when you're depositing or accumulating these crystals, that's generally in an extracellular fashion, right? But when you are, when you have these micro or nanocrystals, they're getting, they can puncture through cell membranes. They can actually cause cells to burst open. Wow. So, so, so you have cells which basically the membrane, if you puncture that, all of the contents can spill out. And that's what you get with calcium oxalate or with these kind of microcrystals. But when they get into the cell, they're, they're biochemically active, right? What that basically means is that in your cell, you, you think you've got hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. I don't think anyone knows how many enzymes are are functioning inside cells so you've got these tiny little proteins which are performing a wide variety of different functions they're converting one thing to another thing and one thing to another thing all of the time that's how your cells work um but essentially what these can do what these what these nanocrystals can do is they can interfere with the function of specific enzymes in the body so or in, inside the cell so you have these um certain enzymes called carboxylase enzymes so it's well established that actually oxalate can dock on to the enzyme and these carboxylase enzymes are involved in multiple areas of metabolism how we're breaking down amino acids how we're breaking down fats how we're undergoing kind of gluconeogenesis how we are um breaking down proteins glucose all of this kind of stuff they're, they're really important but essentially yeah these these biotin dependent enzymes oxalate can dock onto that and actually kind of displace biotin or stick there and biotin's a b vitamin essentially what i'm trying to say is that it can really screw with intracellular biochemistry and you have the organelles that the, the place where your cells make energy called mitochondria right and so actually the mitochondria is like the hub of the cell or how we are making ATP in the form of, or sorry, energy in the form of ATP, which allows us to do all the things that we need to do. Well, oxalate is, is, has been found to like dock onto the mitochondria and it can cause a phenomena referred to as mitochondrial dysfunction, which is essentially, you know, there's various kind of researchers, you read any paper on mitochondria these days and they will relate many long-term chronic illnesses with mitochondrial dysfunction with a lack of energy or it's referred to as the bioenergetic model when cells don't have enough energy then actually you can get a lot of different manifestations of that you can have kind of insulin resistance or you can have kind of many other different types of autoimmune conditions 
and and there's there's many theories now which are saying that actually an an overall energetic deficit inside cells may be the root of that and so if we consider that oxalate is um <laughs> Oxalate is potentially driving some of that mitochondrial dysfunction. It's driving chronic inflammation in tissues. It's driving many of these pathologic changes that you see in other diseases. There's a very good reason to think that actually oxalate is involved, not only in kidney stones, but potentially in many of the chronic health conditions that are not considered to be related to oxalate. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I saw that you wrote a few um, articles on B1 or thiamine. Do you want to talk about the relationship with oxalates and the need for more thiamine? Yeah, of course. So so this is like, um, it hasn't really been fleshed out that much in the literature. There's a couple of kind of theoretical links there. Um, generally, just to give some background, right? So oxalates are not only something that we find in the diet and they're not necessarily always problematic in the diet in small mm -hmm. amounts it's when we have high amounts coming in consistently going through the kidneys going through the liver causing damage causing damage in the rest of the system potentially driving things like fibromyalgia arthritis these kinds of other conditions um and we also robbing us of minerals when we are I haven't said that basically the body is accumulating this, but then it can get rid of it. It's going to be getting rid of it, and that's referred to as dumping, and that's going to be going through the kidneys or the gut. Um, essentially, when it's doing that, it is stealing minerals, so to speak, because you think of it's it's a magnet. It can bind very tightly with potassium, magnesium, calcium, iron, zinc. Uh, it's pulling those things out, so it's doing all of that. But... That is just on a dietary front. So that's just considering that, okay, we have these toxins coming from the diet. But at the same time, oxalate is also a normal metabolite of liver, of, of, of human biochemistry, right? So we are naturally going to be producing some oxalate, the chemical structure of oxalate, in our liver on a daily basis in a very small amount. And that's not a bad thing. Um, but what has been characterized or what has been kind of investigated is this concept of endogenous synthesis so when the body makes too much itself so there is um there's a couple of conditions one is referred to as primary hyperoxaluria okay primary hyperoxaluria and this is where a lot of the information comes about when the um when the body becomes completely overburdened with oxalate we 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 look at the literature on primary hyperox hyperoxaluria and you can see that it deposits in all of these different organs and so primary hyperoxaluria is basically involving this couple different types but it's basically involving some of the enzymes in in the liver involved in something called the glyoxalate pathway mm -hmm. when those enzymes when someone has an inherited um mutation in those enzymes Essentially, what, what can happen is, is that they are uncontrollably driving intermediates, driving precursors down this pathway, making a lot of oxalate themselves. Right. So actually, this is a pathologic condition. It's an it's like, a, you know, it's a genetic heritable condition kind of thing with a genetic mutation. But essentially, the, these per, these people become so overburdened by oxalate because they cannot stop making it. There's no off switch in their liver to stop them from making it. So now that we've kind of covered that, when we're looking at that pathway, it's not only, or it doesn't seem to be the case, that it's only the people with this genetic condition that, that can make oxalate. In fact, it turns out that there are many individuals who are potentially making too much oxalate in their liver for a variety of different reasons which are non-genetic in origin does that mm -hmm. make sense yeah. so actually if you look at something if you we look at some of the precursors for instance you see that we have something called methyl glyoxal and that is um generally produced uh, it's related to protein glycation but that can be in very high levels in diabetes for instance so someone who is a uncontrolled diabetic they've got metabolic syndrome they could potentially be theoretically more likely to make more oxalate in the body and be more predisposed uh, sorry predisposed to the problem of having oxalates <clears throat> at the same time if we're looking at the steps steps in the pathways 
to be able to divert certain intermediates away from producing oxalate, then we need sufficient levels of certain nutrients. Okay, one of those is vitamin B6, and one of those is mm -hmm. thiamine. So the reason for this is is because if we have enough vitamin B6 or if we have enough thiamine, then the precursors that would ordinarily go towards oxalate can be can be made use of in a positive way. So we can take these precursors and actually convert them into glycine or hydroxyproline, which are amino acids and which mm -hmm. we're using to synthesize things like collagen tissue and whatnot. So actually, there's a lot of nuance here. And it's again, it's, it's purely theoretical. But theoretically, there is some animal research to indicate that actually when someone is severely B6 deficient, when they are severely thiamine deficient, vitamin B1 deficient, then they may be predisposed to making more oxalates. Yes, yeah. And there, so there seems to be a relationship there. And again, it's theoretical and it's, it hasn't really been explored much. But what I can say is that I get, since I've been doing kind of videos and interviews and things on oxalates, I get people from all around the world coming to me directly to address this issue um, and what I often see is that the people who do have problems with oxalates oftentimes there is a problem with B1 okay so a thiamine deficit which is enormously common there's it's actually it's crazy how little attention this this deficiency mm -hmm. actually gets I think it's probably one of the, the key things in our modern world but that gets completely overlooked so so there's generally b1 issues and people who have oxalate problems and they respond marvelously to to thiamine oftentimes but then at the same time there's also potentially b6 issues mm -hmm. and so this can be identified somewhat if you're doing a there's a lab called great plains laboratory and they run a test called the organic acids test and occasionally when you when someone thinks that they have problems with oxalates, they display all of all of the symptoms kind of thing. When you run one of these tests, what you will find is that in many cases, they have a couple of the markers. One is called glycolic acid. Another one is called glyceric acid. They can be quite substantially elevated. And these are kind of, they can be indicators for someone having this problem of endogenously producing oxalate, Right. So no, it's interesting because I use Great Plains Labs with my clients. And so it's funny because there's a few things. Um, so I'm totally on the same page with you, but um, there's a few markers on that test, the organic acids test that you can tell if it's an endogenous oxalate creation. So I think it's like the B6 is really low. And then they also have gut health issues, right? Like, so you'll see like arabinosis really high. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I know. I'm not convinced that you see... I in the great the Great Plains training right they will mm -hmm. William Shaw Dr William Shaw the guy yeah. who runs the lab he will train doctors and practitioners and things that this idea that rabinose is a candida marker or is a yeast marker okay now I there's there's two schools of thought here there's okay. the William Shaw school of thought and then there's the Susan Owen school of thought okay so Susan Owens has has been studying this for a long time and she has basically laid out and she's done a couple presentations on it i can send you those after if you want sure. but essentially she's laid out like how a rabbinose there's very little evidence that that is a candida marker okay and oh, in okay. many cases in many cases a rabbinose can actually be a sign of positive gut health like good gut health and that actually when a rabinose drops oftentimes oxalate increases so there's this idea as well which i don't i don't ascribe to and i don't agree with is that yeast produces oxalates or that candida is is a significant source of oxalates if someone goes to a kind of traditional functional medicine practitioner or a functional doctor they will if they if they run one of these tests and i see people who have this so frequently they've been to a doctor they've had this test done and they come up high on oxalate and also high on a rabinose mm. they when they consult with great plains laboratory or the kind of training that they've received from great plains the the kind of idea or this dogma is that if you kill the yeast if you get rid of the yeast then the oxalate will will improve naturally right. because the yeast is the main source of oxalate <clears throat> I can't find any any evidence for that at all. And I've searched and searched and searched. In fact, 
I, again, I, I'm in complete agreement with Susan Owens here that actually I think yeast is sometimes more of a symptom of oxalate problems rather than a cause. Right. You see certain certain species of fungus can produce oxalate that is there's no problem like there's no um kind of uh, argument there so certain types of aspergillus aspergillus mold right. um a couple of the other ones that kind of mold species can but in terms of candida albicans that is not capable as per any of the research that i can find and even the reference studies that that great plains reference it doesn't demonstrate that 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 that, that is a significant producer of oxalate now there is research actually showing and it's very interesting and it's kind of there's not a lot out there but there is in, in research showing that when you feed you see in the gut you have yeast species you have candida and in 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 a kind of healthy environment, right, in a healthy gut, you will always have can candida. It's not usually yeah. pathogenic. It's in its kind of, they call it its budding state, so in its uh, commensal state. So it plays a beneficial role in kind of modulating our immune system, in, you know, balancing out with the other commensals. But actually, what, what you can do when you feed that a lot of oxalate, so either if you have a lot accumulated and you're dumping it through the gut, or when you just eat a really high oxalate diet, what they showed was that when you feed candida too much oxalate, what happens is, is you can you initiate a shift. So you initiate, you activate a stress response in the candida, which identifies oxalate as a poison. And so what it does is it goes into defense mode. And when it goes into defense mode, it goes from being its commensal state, its budded yeast state, to being its hyphal pathogenic state. Mm. So you can theoretically, this is, again, it's theoretical. There's not a lot of evidence on there, but the research would suggest that actually by having a high oxalate diet, that's potentially going to be causing candida from to go from being a good guy to being a bad guy and actually initiating that kind of candidiasis or the systemic or the 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 kind of tough candida gut infection many people find that when they cut oxalates out of the diet or they go on a low oxalate diet candida problems thrush infections fungal fung um toenail fungus mm -hmm. tend to disappear they tend to go away in and of, of themselves that's what i found anyway um so yeah we were talking about the Great Plains organic acids. Yeah. Yes. No, so I'm on, I'm on the same page as you. Um, the way that I've been trained with, and, you know, I actually haven't seen um, Dr. Shaw's um, presentations, but, I mean, I've had other trainings, and uh, the ones that I've seen, it wasn't about the that the candida is feeding the oxalates. It was kind of the other way that you had just mentioned. It was more that eating a high diet in oxalates or you know having too much collagen from the hydroxyproline that goes down to the oxalic yeah. acid you know that route having too little b6 or like you said thiamine all of that can then you know further exacerbate any gut health issues like candida and so right. that's sort of how i was sort of trained from gpl it wasn't the that the um candida feeds um oxalates to be higher so um, right. I'm on the same page with you, but I definitely want to see the Susan Owens um, presentations. I think that'll be interesting. I think oxalates are so interesting. Um, one question I had for you was in terms of carnivore. So, you know, a lot of people follow the carnivore diet. They hear um, talks from you or from Sally Norton, and then they hear, oh, every single, you know, pain, joint pain, um, you know, I, I feel worse after going carnivore for a while. And then everyone is starting to attribute it to oxalate dumping and I just wanted to hear your opinion from your clients um, what have you seen um, does it make sense that everyone's sort of you know blaming everything on oxalates and then you know if you think about it all of us kind of eat a high oxalate diet before knowing that it's oxalate um, high oxalates and so why is it that some people have very blatant symptoms like the kidney stones and then other people it's a kind of a guess, right? Like I have back aches or I have joint pain. Oh, it must be oxalate dumping, right? So if you can kind of talk about that. Yeah, it's a, it's something that is, when you first come across this information, like it's easy <laughs> to ascribe every health problem to oxalates. And there are yeah. people who, who do that, right? They'll say, you know, some of the groups and things, you any any joint pain, any kind of gut issues, anything like that, they say, oh, it's oxalate dumping kind of thing. And so it's really, you know, it's kind of, it's very common. Um, I get a lot of people coming to me 
they've heard either Sally Norton or Susan Owens or myself talking about oxalates and they kind of, you know, they think it's their magic bullet, so to speak. They think that every single symptom that they experience is because of these oxalates. And you see, right, just to go, right, just to go back to some of the symptoms which are really common. The the main symptoms that someone tends to experience, and it can be different for different people, but oftentimes what you might see is related to muscle aches and pains, joint pain that is unexplained and that actually comes on with certain foods or comes on with the um, with the limiting of certain foods, right? So that is one of the key symptoms that a lot of the people describe. There's also skin issues. Skin issues that flare up with different types of foods and go away with certain t- types of foods, again, that's quite common. Another thing that people notice is urinary issues. So urinary issues in the context of frequent urination, in the context of burning urination, frequent urinary tract tract infections, kidney pain, that kind of thing. This is reflecting how the body is getting rid of oxalates. We can do it through every orifice. So we can do it through the nasal passages, through the eyes, through the skin, through the kind of gut, through the um, through the urinary tract. Again, vulvodynia, that is a key symptom. So if there's vaginal pain, if there's chronic vaginal yeast infections, chronic anal itching, chronic vaginal itching, these are key signs and symptoms. If there is any kind of um, gut issues that cycle, which are not related to any identifiable factor. So what you often see is that if someone says they are like on a keto or carnival diet or something, and they have perfect digestion, but every two weeks they get an intense bout of diarrhea that lasts for two days. And during that, they feel fatigued. They feel kind of um, they feel like they have issues. So generally, the, the oxalate-related kind of, the oxalate phenotype, let's call it, uh, the people who experience cyclical changes, and there's lots of symptoms that, you know, if we understand, like, what this is doing and where it can be deposited, you know, in the thyroid gland, it can cause kind of antibodies and high TSH and all this kind of stuff. So actually... There are a wide variety of things that this can cause, but those are really the main kind of symptoms that I have managed to kind of identify that are consistent. Now, one of the key things which is going to indicate whether someone is going through this, there's a couple of things, is like those symptoms that we've already talked about, they can be explained by so many other potential factors, right? There's so many things which can cause joint pain. There's so many things which can cause inflammation or urinary tract infections or anything like that. Or frequent urination, for instance, that can be caused by by an electrolyte imbalance, for instance, Mm -hmm. really easily. So actually, it's important that we don't, that we don't kind of paint everything with the same brush. And oftentimes, like people will come to me thinking they've got oxalate problems, but I'll say, look, that is way like that is definitely not at the top of your list right now. You've got all of this other stuff going on that you need to address. The oxalates are like, they probably not even an issue issue for you. Right. And so it's important to differentiate kind of, or to, to have the listeners understand that oxalates don't appear to be a problem for everyone. They, they just don't like some people can eat a high oxalate diet for a long time. And when I say high oxalate, I'm talking probably 500, 600 milligrams. Okay, once you go past the kind of 1,500 milligram mark with green smoothies and things, you are asking for problems. But actually many people who do eat kind of like a ketogenic diet with dark chocolate and things, they don't seem to have these issues. And there's a couple of, like, there's many factors which govern this. One is the composition of gut bacteria, theoretically. Another one is dietary calcium content, because dietary calcium is protective. Another one is whether someone is chronically stressed, whether they have immune activation, whether they do exercise, you know, whether they are whether they are in cr- chronic fight or flight mode, whether their um, whether their gut is permeable, whether they've got good gut health. You know, there's so many factors which are involved here. So actually, it's definitely not a problem for everyone. One of the main kind of signs that would indicate that it is a problem for someone, if someone doesn't want to do testing, and I will, like, just you know, make it clear that testing is not diagnostic. Testing differs from day to day. Like, you can do an organic acids on one person, you know, Monday and then do it again on Wednesday and it can be p- completely different. So it's a snapshot in time. 
and the way that the body's clearing oxalates is different for different people. So it follows like a weird circadian rhythm that is different for each person. And so actually we can't rely on testing to diagnose this. What I often find is that when the symptoms are cyclical, that is a good sign or that is a kind of, that's an indicator. Again, the typical kind of symptoms that we've indicated or that we've identified, but there's also another kind of key, uh, key way of identifying whether this is a problem or not is that when someone does go through a cyclical period of symptoms where the symptoms get worse, if the symptoms improve by doing certain things, then you can have a good idea that it might be related to oxalates. So for instance, if someone has severe fatigue, headaches, they have rapid heartbeat, and they have kind of diarrhea, for instance, then if they eat a food which is high in oxalates, and it disappears, all of the symptoms get better, you can be pretty sure that this is an oxalate related problem. Again, certain supplements such as calcium, magnesium, potassium, along with the citrate component, if that improves the kidney pain, or if that improves the diarrhea, or if that improves the kind of uh, vaginal itching, then again, it's a, it's, it's a kind of, it's an indicator that this may be what someone is is experiencing, okay? Again, there's always going to be differential diagnosis. There's always going to be multiple things that go on. But one of the key the, the key things that I look for is if someone has had a history of um, high oxalate intake in the diet. That's one thing. A history of things like antibiotic use. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. If someone is, as I said, experiencing cyc cyclical symptoms, which generally get worse when they cut out oxalates or when they have low oxalates in their diet and then at the same time if they get better when they eat more oxalates that is you know almost certain that this problem have, has this person has a problem there's many people who don't right so actually you know it's it's kind of again we as human beings we like to have everything in like set boxes <laughs> and yeah we like to compartmentalize things and say right okay uh, I know the answers now, and this is likely what's causing. We like to have answers. We like to have certainty. We don't like the chaos of uncertainty kind of thing. But you know what I try to continually get across to people is that this is uh, applicable to a subsection of people. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who this doesn't seem to apply to. Yeah, I think the one thing I would also add as an indicator is if in general in your family you have ki um, kidney issues or if you've yeah. had kidney stones. I mean, that's like the obvious one, but I just wanted to point it out because you didn't mention it. Um, and just for reference for some of the people listening, um, you know, people don't know what 500 milligrams is. Is that like one spinach? So do you kind of want to give a little bit of reference? Um, I know yeah. one other food that you didn't mention that's very high in oxalates is turmeric the turmeric powder. So that's another thing I just wanted to mention. But if you, yeah. want, if you want to give an example of what 500 milligrams might be. Okay. Um, let me just double check because I tend to forget the milligram contents. Yeah. Um, but generally, mm -hmm. yeah, as, before going into that, I just want to, there's a couple of other foods that I didn't sure. pinpoint. Turmeric is one of those, black pepper, many things like cinnamon. It's not going to be problematic in small amounts for a healthy person but right. when someone is having tablespoons of this in their smoothie every day that's you know it's it's completely unnatural like it, it gets away from the the original kind of concept of using these medicinal herbs as medicinal herbs yeah. you know in, in ayurveda or whatever um but in in the other foods which i think it's important that your listeners understand are are very high is actually many of the gluten-free grains Grains in general are, are higher than, uh, you know, they are clusters high, but particularly many of the gluten-free grains where someone thinks that they're going on a healthy diet because they are cutting out gluten. And then what they do is they replace the bread or they replace the cakes with certain types of gluten-free flour, um, nut flours, for instance, almond flour, which is very popular in something like the GAPS diet. And actually when you have... Um, you're you're kind of uh, you're breaking down these nuts and making a flour. You're getting a very high amount of oxalates, amaranth, um, ta not tapioca, not tapioca starch, but amaranth. Um, what else? I Almost think all of them. Sorghum and also um, there was another one. I forget yeah. now. But. Yeah, there's, there's, there's. Oh, brown rice. Brown rice oh, is really high. In yeah, brown rice. Brown rice is high. 
again, many of these grains, some of the legumes, not so much chickpeas, you know, not all greens. So things like lettuce, rocket, or I think you call that arugula. Um, yeah, yeah, arugula. <laughs> arugula, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's many grains, uh, green vegetables that aren't particularly high. Um, so it's important to distinguish exactly kind of what is what because it's easy to put all foods into this one category and kind yeah. of demonize entire food groups. Um, right, so one cup of raw spinach. So if you if you have a cup measurement and you fill that with wait, sorry about that. If you if you fill the cup measurement with um with spinach, you are getting approximately two hundred milligrams of oxalate. Okay, so let me give an example. If someone is doing a green juice or green smoothie, they might be having, I, I don't know, I never did the green juices, but I think some people put like two cups of spinach, something yeah. like that. I think that's minimal, right? Yeah. Minimal. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I guess it can be worse. But essentially, um, if you are cooking down your spinach, then if you have a dish, I mean, spinach cooks down into absolutely nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So actually, you, you can quite easily have, have a dish. I mean, 500 milligrams is essentially two cups of spinach. Um, how much almond flour? I mean, I think you're looking at about two cups of almond flour as well or three cups of almond flour. So, I mean, that's like a couple of cookies right. or like, uh, you know, like a say a big slice of a cake with dark chocolate in it. I think cacao is, is, is generally really high. Um, there's, there's lots of lists online um, which go through the exact amounts, but generally many of them are kind of based on some outdated data. So there is a Facebook group which is called Trying Low Oxalates, and they've actually mm -hmm. collated a lot of the data which has been kind of cross-referenced and verified. So they've got kind of the, the most up-to-date and comprehensive list of foods. Um, and yeah, generally you'd be surprised at how little of a food that you would need to, to reach 500 milligrams. Yeah. Now, just, just for kind of reference so that your listeners understand, um, the recommended amount, I think it's the American Kidney Association. I think it is. But the recommended amount is that, is that you have no more than 150 milligrams per day. Oh, right? well, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, so generally, no more than 150 milligrams per day. Anything more than 150 milligrams is potentially going to contribute toward or is potentially going to predispose someone to develop things like um, kidney stones or, or something like that. Whereas, you know... In a, in a, for reference, in one of these green juices, if you're having, if you're having turmeric, if you're having cinnamon, if you're having, uh, say maybe some some kind of juice kale and some spinach, then actually what you can be, you can be easily topping kind of a gram easily, easily a gram, and when that happens, that's you know you, you're very much asking for problems. Yeah, and a lot of people add almond milk which is like the unsweetened almond milk, they'll add peanut butter, they might add a little bit of cacao, and that all, like you said, adds to more oxalates. So, you know, in terms of uh, people transitioning to car the carnivore diet, then would you recommend that everyone, you know, slowly transitions off oxalates? Or, you know, is it that most people can go full carnivore, not worry about the oxalate dumping? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Right. Yeah. So it has to be assessed on, on an individual basis. Right. So essentially, if someone tries to go carnivore, uh, if they've been on a very high oxalate diet, they try to go carnivore and they immediately notice some quite severe symptoms, then I would say like they need to be adding in oxalate pretty quickly to their diet. And that's because on, on the groups who've been doing this for kind of two decades, it's generally recommend to reduce it very, very, very gradually. And the reason for this is, is because if someone has um, a high burden of oxalates in their body, um, the body will try to get rid of it kind of as quickly as possible. OK, mm -hmm. and one of the primary determinants of how the body is getting rid of that is going to be the amount that's in the blood at any one given time. So if you're on a consistently high level of uh, high oxalate diet, then you're going to be propping up this blood level consistently. And and your 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 tissues are going to preferentially be accumulating that. Your kidneys are going to be filtering whatever they can at any one given time, but that's fairly limited. Whereas when you have, for instance, when you go on a carnivore diet, you're cutting down your oxalate to practically zero overnight. So when that happens, the blood level of oxalate you, you don't have as much coming in from the 
from from the gut because you're not eating any oxalate containing foods and so actually what you then develop is you you have a very low level of oxalate in the blood and when that blood level drops then your tissues get basically they they sense the 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 drop in oxalate in the blood and they they start to dump it so they start to release it and when you you are releasing it it's it's activating your immune system it's pulling minerals it's doing all of this kind of weird and wacky stuff and it can cause a wide variety of problems quite severe problems for certain people so actually if someone does have um, a long standing issue with this then i mean there's there's multiple cases i've had several cases i know sally's warned about this for a very long time so is susan owens is that actually certain people when they cut it out too quickly they can become acutely hypokalemic end up in the emergency room or accident and emergency as it's called in the uk um, <laughs> end up in accident and emergency in the uk simply because what's happening is is this massive dump of oxalate is essentially binding to a lot of the potassium screwing with the entire electrolyte and mineral balance and then what you're getting then is you're having all of this potassium wasting through the kidneys and so someone is developing symptoms like they think they're having a heart attack they're getting severe palpitations they can't breathe they're having anxiety panic attacks so they go to the er department and they might find that actually they've got low blood potassium other than that everything is fine right they may have like a t-wave inversion on the ekg but ultimately most of the things they're just told that you know it's an anxiety attack or something so actually in many cases it can be very severe and so people can experience just a wide variety or a, 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 a greatening in the severity of the symptoms that they've been dealing with for a very long time and it can be so severe that it you know it's a major stressor for the body so in those cases i would recommend to do it very much slowly if someone thinks that they might have an oxalate problem they need to do it gradually right most people who don't have these issues, like they can go immediately to carnivore. I do that with several people. If you've got someone in good metabolic health and they just, you know, say they're into kind of uh, sports or something like that or performance, you know, they just want to transition or they, or they want to try it out, then I don't see, you know, probably 70, 80% of people will not have a problem transitioning. The issue is, is this subsection of people who are poisoned by oxalates, they can do themselves a lot more damage. So in regards to kind of my, the, the principle, the principle is more faster is not better. In fact, slower is sometimes better. And it's very difficult to get that across to people because when you understand that you've potentially been poisoned and you've accumulated that poison and it's coming from a food that you're eating, then most people have an innate aversion to that food. They don't want to continue poisoning their body or they don't want to continue eating a food which they know is causing their health problems. Problem is, is that they need to for the time being. And generally over, you know, the period of maybe two, three, four months even, if it's very significant, they need to kind of gradually reduce that. So you think the transition period is about four months at its peak? Um to kind of like taper down to lesser oxalates um is it is there or is there no like kind of time frame i mean what do you mean by tapering down or you know slowing down the um consumption of oxalates like what would that time frame look like okay so that's gonna differ greatly between different people so for instance right. there's this idea that you should basically you should calculate how much you've had I, I don't tend to do this but they do this kind of in a more controlled way on the groups and things you calculate how much you have and then you divide that by 10 or 20 and you cut that down so so you cut down by either five percent per week or ten percent per week oh, depending wow. on how fast that is going to be and so for some people you know if they've been on like a 1500 milligram green smoothie oxalate diet for a long period of time then the amount that they're reducing, you know, you divide kind of 1,000, they're going to be reducing it by kind of like 75 milligram per per week, okay? So that can take a long time. That's like many weeks kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, many other people find that actually they can do it a lot quicker. Um, I generally aim for, I mean, if someone wants to go completely carnivore, then I would say in someone really severe, I mean, the, the definition of, of, a low, of a low oxalate diet is under 50 milligrams, okay? Under 50 milligrams. So, uh, again, working, calculating that kind of, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but you have to, you have to calculate it. 
that's really low, right? And on a carnivorous, primarily carnivorous diet, I mean, it's very, you know, you're on practically zero oxalate. So in that case, to move towards a primarily carnivorous diet, if I think that that's what someone needs, if they've been on a moderate oxalate diet, then we would do that in within the space of like three weeks, right? In right. some people, you'd throw them straight into it. But in other people, in the people who you know are poisoned, who you have kind of test results, who you, you, you just know, right? You, you get a feel for it. You know these people have problems. If you do it quicker than over... I mean, I said four months, three to four months generally, very, 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 very slowly. Just, just really slowly. So, like taking out one food, or say if they're having, say if they're having like, um, you know, three stalks of Swiss chard, right? You know the leaves, three mm -hmm. leaves with with their dinner. I would say, right, okay. So take away one of those in the right, week. Right, right. <laughs> just no, makes, really slowly. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I'll just add uh, one thing that Sally Norton said when I talked to her back then was. The reason why it's not good to experience the oxalate dumping, because I know some people think, well, why don't I just go through the oxalate dumping real quick and then kind of get over it? But it, the risk is that you can actually damage cells where they won't, you know, they'll die. And so it's not yeah. ideal to go through that oxalate dumping. Um, yeah. In terms of anti nutrients, so what do you think about the other ones like lectins, phytates? Do you think, you know, oxalic acid is kind of the worst? Um. I think it's context dependent, right? So mm -hmm. some people can eat oxalates and not necessarily have that much of a problem. Not a high oxalate diet, but they can't touch lectins, for instance. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So again, it's like we need to be looking at the individual. Yeah. And that's where it gets really difficult because you like to just apply these blanket rules to everyone. I mean, I'll be honest, like I generally recommend more of a, you know, more of a carnivorous kind of approach or primarily carnivorous. Um, but in there's many people who don't want to go that route, right? right? So it's kind of identifying. I think the oxalate is insidious because it accumulates. I think it, it you know, it it is a real problem because it's not just like it's triggering the immune system it's not like dairy for instance if you've got an intolerance to dairy and it's causing you acne or it's causing you kind of autoimmune disease when you cut it out after like a month or two months generally like that will address the problem when you have this problem of accumulation of oxalates that when you cut it out that's not even the start you haven't even started the process the process is going to go on potentially for years right years so that's why i think this stuff is really dangerous and oftentimes as well is because if someone has a problem with dairy then or i keep saying dairy but you know it, it could be any food it could be a plant toxin so okay if, if someone has a problem with gluten generally one of the primary signs is they might develop brain fog or they might get bloating or they might get kind of joint pain or they might notice that their psoriasis flares right so oftentimes with something like gluten or non-celiac gluten sensitivity there's usually some kind of a an immediate reaction or right. a delayed it can be a delayed onset hypersensitivity but it can be a, like you know three days to a week so you can say okay i had that cake last week and now i you know i've broken out in psoriasis i'm pretty sure that that's the cake right problem is with oxalate oxalate is that you can go a very long time consuming so many oxalates way more than your body can deal with and you don't get any negative response there's usually no problem. There's usually no identifiable issue that it's causing you a problem. In fact, many of these people say that they feel great. They feel fantastic on green smoothies. And then eventually it goes downhill. And right. then like, and you know, sometimes it's a year, two years, three years down the line, sometimes even longer, 10 years down the line that they identify that they realize, okay. And then they actually, their body has accumulated this stuff it takes a long time to get rid of, right? So I think that oxalate is, I personally, it's, you know, I think it's one of the arch enemies in many people. So I would say it's it's more dangerous than the others. But again, you know, always context dependent. And there right. are kind of individual sensitivities, salicylates, for instance, you know, glutamates, uh, you name it. There's all these different kinds of things which cause people problems. So it's hard to differentiate. It's assessed on a case-by-case -case basis kind of thing. Yes. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's very bio-individual um, in terms of anti-nutrients and, you know, what um, is the most beneficial anti-nutrient for you to stay away from. Um, 
let's talk a little bit about biotin. So I know that um, some people say that on a high oxalate diet that um, the bio um, the bioabsorption of biotin becomes very difficult. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, okay. So biotin is one of the B vitamins. It's referred to as B7. Mm -hmm. um, it's involved in, I mean, it doesn't get the attention that it deserves, right? But I mean, it's generally known for healthy hair, healthy nails, healthy yeah. skin. Um, but at the same time, it's actually critical in how we're metabolizing energy, right? And so I was saying before, you have these enzymes, these car carboxylase enzymes, and these are primarily well these require biotin as a cofactor biotin is also involved in how we are um in the kind of cell cycle uh, the expression of chromatin, the expression of certain types of DNA. We're using biotin in a process called biotinylation. Um, so it's really important on many different fronts. But actually, biotin, as it is kind of docking onto these enzymes, you have oxalate for whatever reason. It can, it can do that in place of biotin. So it can kind of – it's. I think it. I think the way that it works is it's kind of displacing biotin, so mm -hmm. that actually you've got the enzyme, but the enzyme isn't working. So you can maybe you've got enough biotin, but actually you can be, in, you can present with the symptoms of a functional biotin deficiency, right? So sometimes that's actually pretty difficult to identify. I mean, one of the best tests for biotin deficiency is uh, beta hydroxy isovaleric acid in the urine, right? And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, you would find that on a Genova ion and a Genova Nutraval. Uh, methyl citric is also a marker that you might find on a GPLO, but I find it's not as sensitive. Problem is, is that theoretically, if you've got this problem, you could, I mean, you might, it might, be so subtle that it's not showing up on the tests. I've had many people who don't show up as biotin deficient on the tests, mm -hmm. but who when they take biotin, they have really good results, right? So we can't always go off test results. Some people, there's like non-linear ways that these, these vitamins are working. I think sometimes what they're doing is perhaps signaling other areas that aren't necessarily identifiable via testing. Um, but essentially, yeah, so when people have this problem, a little bit like thiamine, when people have a problem with oxalates, generally the, the three key nutrients that I find are prim prim primarily an issue is, is the B1, the B6, and also biotin. So biotin, what, what can happen is, is that if you do theoretically in the intracellular compartment or in the, on the compartment of enzymes, the active site, if you have oxalate, which has basically been bound up to many of these enzymes, when you take biotin, when some people actually supplement with biotin, and I'm not convinced that you can get enough from a diet, no matter what kind of diet you're eating, many times it has to be super physiologic doses, sometimes in the realm of kind of 10,000 or a th at least a thousand times the RDA, sometimes 10,000 times the RDA, or, you know, uh, actually what's happening is, is what it's theorized to do is potentially displace, displace oxalate from... <clears throat> from this enzyme and kind of dock on to where the enzyme is. It's a similar concept of, um, don't know if you know much about testosterone replacement or testosterone okay. optimization therapy, this idea that actually you need, um, you need external forms of testosterone to displace the endocrine disrupting chemicals bound on the receptor. Little bit kind of similar concept that actually sometimes it almost seems like in these people you need a high dose of biotin to actually displace oxalate. But when that happens, what can happen happen is is that you are initiating a dumping scenario so you are kind of potentially going to be liberating free oxalate which is sure. then passed out of cells via the transporters and then again it hasn't really been characterized what we do know is that when someone takes biotin it can help with many of their health issues but at the same time it can produce the symptoms which they associate with oxalates Okay, mm -hmm. which they associate with oxalate dumping. Similar thing can happen with thiamine and B6. If someone is in, is is endogenously producing oxalate, then again, it's kind of possible that what might be happening is that when they are taking exogenous thiamine or B6, they're reducing the amount that is being made in the liver and therefore reducing the the blood level, yeah. therefore initiating it to be coming out of tissues and therefore dumping it. So actually. A lot of it is anecdotal. I mean, we have some theoretical framework for how this might work. Unfortunately, the research hasn't been done, but the, th the, the anecdotes are by, you know, looking at kind of 25, 30,000 people 
worldwide who experience similar things that sometimes they need thiamine supplementation sometimes they need b6 and sometimes they need biotin and when that happens it can initiate a dump similar kind of process with epsom salt baths or any kind of sulfur supplement because what it's potentially doing is pulling out or pushing out oxalate from the cells with this thought process um with your clients how you know knowing that our body uses so many enzymes and cofactors right we don't always know if a certain nutrient deficiency is because of that true nutrient deficiency so how do you solve for that when you work with clients if they're you know low in b1 or b6 do you just supplement with those um I, i'm curious to know the way you do that um do you think just you know solving by giving a b complex vitamin makes sense i mean what are your thoughts right <clears throat> there's kind of different schools of thought here right so there's this idea particularly in kind of carnival or animal-based nutrition or keto that you know you definitely don't need supplements you can get it all from the diet and i think that oh no you know, I, i'm not on that same page um no, just, I, I think no, 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 i'm people, not saying that you are I'm yeah not no, you i know that most saying. people are yeah um i think uh most carnivores you're right they believe just eating meats will heal everything but i think if you have bad gut health i think you need support so i am not on that same page but go okay, ahead yeah i'm uh, yeah I, i'm glad that we agree there because okay. i'll be honest yeah there are many failures right and they benefit from supplementation so yes. actually like okay yeah so so in the context of a chronic nutrient deficiency then it's like right there's a couple kind of ideas of how to how to go about this there's this notion that okay you take a b complex where you're taking things that you don't necessarily need so you might not need b6 but you might only need the biotin so why take the b complex thing is with that is that you know all of the b vitamins are water soluble right so your body has a pretty good way of getting rid of what it doesn't need as long as you're not mega dosing like multiple different nutrients then Oftentimes, I don't see that taking a B-complex is, is problematic. And there are several, I mean, Derek Lonsdale, for instance, who kind of pioneered the work on thiamine, kind of insisted that whenever you are to replace thiamine, for instance, um, you need to do it with a B-complex behind it. So I generally use a B-complex in... Um, you know, just as a kind of safety measure, and people generally find that it gives them a perk of energy and things. Um, ultimately, in terms of resolving or identifying like a chronic nutrient issue, sometimes it won't come up in testing. But again, you see, there's this idea, right? Uh, again, this is kind of taking a note from Lonsdale's book. I don't know if you're familiar with um, with the book by Chandler Mars and Derek Lonsdale. It's called High Calorie Malnutrition. Uh, thiamine deficiency disease and dysautonomia no i don't but i'll um i'll put it in the show notes i'll get right that. okay yeah i'll send you that okay so okay. he lays out a framework and i think it you know it seems to make so much sense and it's exactly what i see in real life when someone has been on a processed carbohydrate diet or processed modern diet for such a long period of time and they they say they are suffering from some kind of chronic illness particularly when we're looking at things like chronic fatigue syndrome muscle activation syndrome fibromyalgia the very complex very complex conditions that it's so multifaceted kind of thing and there's no one one kind of there's no one way around it you have to work on multiple levels at multiple different times so in a case like this, when someone has gone uh, such a long time being so deficient in certain nutrients, then there's this idea that actually the body, to conserve energy, what it will do is potentially downregulate the number or the, the quantity of enzymes that are using a particular cofactor, right? So let me give you an example, right? He, he Lonsdale did a lot of his work on thiamine, and I, you know, I, I really think that this is very important but actually what he found or what he theorized what he identified was that when we consume and this is a not a radical concept it's a very basic kind of nutrition when you consume refined foods when you consume this high calorie so lots of macronutrients but low ma micronutrients mm -hmm. Because we need the micronutrients to process the macronutrients, when we are having lots of refined empty calories, we're gradually depleting our micronutrient stores, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you kind of can maintain a level of kind of stable physiology with continual supply of macronutrients and micronutrients, you're probably going to be in good health. But actually because 
the majority of kind of Westerners have this bombardment of sugar processed refined carbohydrates what this is very much doing is depleting many of our nutrients but primarily our thiamine because thiamine is the key nutrient is the most important nutrient to burn carbohydrates and actually on a high carbohydrate diet you're using roughly twice as much b1 as you are the other nutrients in processing the energy so actually because many people who come to us right they come to us they had long-term kind of history of consuming lots of sugar very likely that their thiamine status has been quite poor and what can happen is is that essentially when the status or when the intake of, of the nutrient is low for such a long period of time you think these these nutrients are cofactors for specific enzymes right. and the problem is is that these enzymes are energy costly to maintain right it's costly to maintain and repair an enzyme or a protein so actually if you've got this continually low amount of micronutrient coming in then what you what you are likely going to do to conserve energy down regulate many of the processes which aren't being used efficiently because you are deficient. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So in this case, it's almost like then you have something like the straw that broke the camel's back. So someone will kind of, you know, there's this idea that there's these antecedents. So chronic stress, antibiotic use, drug use, toxicity, poor diet. These are the antecedents, but then there's this trigger. I'm sure you see it all the time because I see it all the time. The trigger is like the straw that broke the camel's back and it's never the cause, but it's usually just something small, a family trauma, an infection, something like that. And and all of a sudden, they they their they, they, they health just completely crashes right they call it a crash oftentimes in their own words so they say that's when their health crashed well at bringing someone out of that state is in so much harder than how they got into there and it's yeah. kind of like this it's very likely that there's a complex array of chronic nutrient deficiencies which kind of set them up for that and then boom that initial trigger kind of you know as i said calls them to crash and so there's this idea that perhaps what is going on is these long-term adaptations to conserve energy are part of, of that kind of lower state of physiology after the crash. So it's like you've got someone with chronic fatigue syndrome. Actually, by giving them a, a, a nutrient-rich diet, what you're doing is, yeah, you, you're giving them kind of what they would have required previously. But because everything's down-regulated to conserve energy, it's almost like it's not enough. So even though you're improving nutrient density, I think this applies with B6. I think this applies with B1, biotin perhaps. Because you are kind of – the body is in this conservation mode. It's in this survival mode kind of thing. It's almost like in that state, the only way to get it out, and this is Lonsdale's theory, but I found it to be perfectly correct, is the only way to get someone out of that lower metabolic state is by saturating or mega dosing specific nutrients mm. to kind of wake the system back up again. It's almost like telling the system that it doesn't have to worry anymore. It doesn't have to conserve so much energy. It has enough to do what it needs to do, and so it can start upregulating all of these essential functions and someone can start making energy again does that kind of make sense yeah no so i i completely agree i mean that's how whenever i work with um clients initially they're on a lot of supplements because we do the symptom burden assessment where we just kind of look at how their symptoms are showing signs of you know maybe their organs or certain areas need support yeah. and in these areas you know that's why i think a lot of people that start carnivore and they're like, well, I'm eating all this meat. Why am I not feeling as good? Or why am I still not able to sleep through the night? Or, you know, or they still have adrenal issues. And it's like, yeah, maybe you need a little bit of support because yeah. maybe you still have gut issues. Maybe your adrenals were that that whole HPA access was a little wonky that you need a little bit more supplement support, right? Um, yeah. I think one yeah. of the indications is how a lot of people can't lose weight, right? Because their hormones are all messed up. And I think it was like you were saying, the micronutrient deficiencies will shut off the areas that are, you know, considered more ancillary to survival, right? And so I'm completely on the same page. And that's where I think a lot of people should start with supplementation to, you know, um, facilitate the healing process. And then you can down regulate a lot yeah. of the supplements. So I'm completely on the same page. And I, I didn't know of this um, man's work and it sounds, uh, yeah, I would definitely like to read it's, the book. It's fascinating. 
Yeah, and I'll be honest, like, I think that you would find a lot of clinical utility because I see, you know, like, as you said, you know, there's some people on carnivore, because you read all of these amazing testimonies. Yeah. Everyone is, you know, in magic land. It, it fixes all of their problems. Yet for many people, they read those testimonials and they, what they feel like is they, they, they wonder why they can't achieve that. Yeah. right because they have been doing this maybe they've been doing it a year maybe they've been doing it six months or something 18 months and they still do not feel well they're still in this kind of state and they're actually you know i've had that many cases of using high dose nutrients and back to the original question that you kind of an asked it's kind of identifying what that person needs and oftentimes yeah. it's symptoms as well so going through you know this is where a case history a non-biased approach and actually a very in-depth case history looking at all the symptoms the reactions everything like that if you know what to look out for as you know you can really pinpoint things which might have been missed and then you know a temporary period of quite high dose supplementation their response to that is going to tell you everything and that actually right. sometimes i mean i've had some people i had one guy he'd been on carnival for i mean how long he'd been on carnival for like a year he'd had diarrhea he'd have all these kinds of things so you're looking at kind of okay potentially nutrient deficiencies but he'd had a history of fibromyalgia chronic fatigue mm -hmm. dizziness vertigo we used a very high do high dose b1 b2 b complex and within like a week you know, he had he had he had made ninety five percent more improvements than he had in the entire year previous just doing carnival, right? So, again, like I forget the question that you asked because I've kind of oh, gone up just... on a tangent. I I apologize. No, no, I completely agree with you. That's why I, I you know I love what you just explained, but it's really just. Um... You know, if if you were to do like the oats test and in some of the nutrients um, specifics, if they say, oh, you know, this person is low in B6, do you just go and um, you as we talk about how a lot of nutrients have cofactors and coenzymes, do you, it does it make sense to then um, just, you know, implement a B6 regimen um, more than maybe trying to dig a little deeper and see if what the really core issue of why the B6 is low. Yeah, uh, of course. So, so again, in that context, you want to identify why they are low in B6, first right. of all. So is it that they are taking the oral contraceptive pill? Do they have a history of taking the oral contraceptive pill? Are they, have they got chronic digestive issues? Is there something else going on? You kind of look at the risk factors for deficiency. You know, are they, are they drinking half a bottle of wine every night? Doesn't matter if they're eating loads of liver. Are they, you know, are they still an alcoholic kind of thing? So there's always these other kinds of things. And depending on the nutrients, I would generally tend to, um, you know, err on the side of caution. If I'm going to use one nutrient in high doses, I will tend to use a B complex behind that just to be safe. Um, but ultimately, with specific nutrients, you would be looking at specific cofactors. So, for instance, B1, generally the, the primary cofactor for B1 is actually magnesium. So the idea you shouldn't be giving thiamine without magnesium. But then what often happens, particularly in carnivores, is that if someone is very deficient in thiamine and you give high doses of thiamine with magnesium, what I tend to see a lot is that actually they start, there's like an increased requirement for potassium. Yeah. So actually their potassium goes right down and they might not even be taking any magnesium. They may have to come off the magnesium, actually replenish potassium instead. So it's kind of like continually keeping an eye, retesting yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, with something like B6, I mean, yeah, with B6, I think it's less specific. So I would be right. looking at, okay, B6 with a B complex. With something like biotin, you have to keep in mind biotin's interaction with pantothenic acid. So mm -hmm. some women actually find that they can develop cystic acne with biotin. And sometimes that can be helped with taking a pantothenic acid or B5 to the side of it. Because biotin can kind of interact with... Um, with it can stop your absorption of pantothenic acid but then what you often find as well is that by giving one high dose of nutrient it does inevitably throw out others so yeah. what you find with someone with oxalate problems they've got issues with thiamine they've got kind of chronic fatigue or dysautonomia you give a very high dose of thiamine but then you need to monitor their, monitor their folate and b12 status because what this can do 
and again, Lonsdale kind of explains it very nicely, eloquently, but it kind of unmasks other, other deficiencies. As you are pushing one pathway, you're kind of having um, effects on other pathways yeah. and you're, you're kind of speeding up everything. So you say you're putting down the gas pedal and then you are ultimately going to be unmasking or un, un, kind of highlighting other deficiencies which were not previously a problem because everything slowed down, mm -hmm. but actually as you start to speed things up, then it turns out that actually they're low as well in other things. Now, ideally, you want to be getting everything from the diet. So right. I like to recommend, I mean, some people don't agree with this. I like to recommend kind of a nose to tail approach in terms of, okay, if they're, you know, if they're low in folate, try get as much liver as possible. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, if they've got a chronic health condition, then we have to understand that actually these metabolic conditions, these health conditions can cause wasting of certain nutrients. We can have um, sparing of other nutrients, we can have kind of increased requirement. If someone has chronic arthritis and it takes them six months to get over, to, kind of to, to get into remission with carnivore, we have to understand the effects of inflammation on glutathione, the effects of inflammation on B6. If you've got inflammation in a tissue, you're depleting B6 locally. So you're therefore increasing your requirement. And some people, if they're in this chronic inflammatory state, it just doesn't seem that you can get enough from the diet. Now, maybe right. 20,000 years ago, excellent, yeah. But you don't have all of these chemicals and toxins and things that we have nowadays. Um, and again, <clears throat> kind of, um, you know, to be, what's the word, maybe a maverick, but more of a kind of a heretic kind of thing. I actually use vitamin C in some carnivores because I find that actually some people get bleeding gums and they get kind of other... I've had a couple of people who present with what you would call clinical scurvy, or at least subclinical scurvy, not end-stage scurvy. And, you know, I will admit that 90% of people on carnival probably don't need any vitamin C or they don't need to take it. They get enough from the diet. But when we factor in these chronic inflammatory conditions, heavy metal burden, as you understand, you know, mercury, aluminium, arsenic, all of these effects – they deplete our methyl donors, so right. that increases our requirement for methylation, the methylated B vitamins. They deplete our glutathione status. They deplete all of this stuff. And actually, we need to recycle glutathione. We do that using vitamin C. Or no, sorry. We recycle vitamin C using glutathione. So if we are depleting our glutathione status, then whatever little vitamin C that we're getting in, we may not be able to recycle. So sometimes a little bit, just a little bit supplementally, while someone is kind of on their road to health comes in handy and i'm really glad that you kind of uh you know that you can see that as well yeah no i mean that's why i always say nutrition is so complex that it's like you know just to use a hormone replacement therapy when you don't know what exactly in the whole you know um, endocrine system is kind of causing that um whether it's like too much cortisol is stealing all the b vitamins that affect the hormones right there's so many complex pathways and so i am completely on the same page and i love that you talked specifically about all these b complex vitamins because a lot of carnivores believe well i eat so much meat and all the meat has all the b vitamins so why would i ever need a b vitamin complex right and in certain situations we do need it right and you've talked so eloquently about a lot of them and so i love it i mean i'm a firm believer that while you're healing, if you are sick enough to kind of try carnivore, then you may need, right, you may need the supplementation. And why wait, like two years for your micronutrients to like upregulate, as you said, when you can kind of do it in the beginning first few months, and then not have to supplement, not have to suffer. But um, it's like you said, there's a lot of dogma about no, when you go carnivore, you eat just meat, drink water and you're healed forever, right? And it's just, it's unfortunate because a lot of people don't have to suffer for as long as um, a lot of people do because they believe in these anecdotal stories. And you're obviously going to hear, hear the ones that are the most um, fast healing, right? And the most um, awe-inspiring. And that's why they get tremendous play. But a lot of people, they don't heal that quickly, you know, and so, and I've seen that in my clients, obviously, it sounds like you've seen it in your clients. Just from your experience, do you see any new um, supplements or nutrients that maybe carnivores, um, and I know, again, this is very bio individual, but would you say that there are specific supplements that you generally see, or nutrients that you generally see carnivores should be kind of consuming more? That's, 
<clears throat> That's an excellent question. Um, right, so there's a couple things that I think generally would not hurt to at least go through period of time mm -hmm. that everyone could probably getting a li little bit more of. I would say iodine is one of those. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work on iodine. I'm yeah. not saying 50 milligram doses. I don't necessarily think that that is for everyone, but actually a low dose of iodine. If you look at the analysis of certain foods, we're not we're not necessarily getting a lot. We are coming right. into contact with chlorine, bromine, these things which actively rob us. So, right. so what I would say to your question is kind of, you know, I like to take a kind of 30,000 foot view if possible and look at all of the things that potentially are stealing stuff away from us, stealing the good things and adding the bad things. And one of those, you know, iodine is definitely attacked. It's attacked in our body. It's, you know, it's very much kind of, uh, disrupted. Another one is potentially bull run, right? Bull run. I don't know if the dietary intake of bull run is significant. It depends where you are. Same as silica. It depends exactly where you are. Your water supply. Most of us right. have kind of, you know, we have different water supplies. We have kind of heavy metals in our water supplies in our tap water, this kind of stuff. Um, generally, yeah, I would say bull run iodine, maybe silica. Those are two kind of, or three, trace minerals which i think aren't going to hurt in very low doses and i i personally take those i don't you know i don't think that um you know I, I don't see any any negative to kind of you know i'd rather be safe than sorry right. um in terms of again it's again it's highly individual right so i work with a lot of people with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia I use B1 in many of those people. I, okay. do, I, ju I just do because it tends to be, you know, you just attract a certain type of client. Well, I, yeah, I just tend to attract people who think that they have a B1 deficiency and actually their symptoms fit well and they respond really well to that. Um, one thing I'll say is um, there is a functional test that you can do for iodine deficiency and it's getting that um, iodine tincture, you know, so when you have um, like a wound, you use that, um, the the antiseptic and so what you can do is put it on your skin and you'd make like a small patch you note the time and then I think it's for about 24 hours if you can still see a stained patch on your skin it's kind of telling you that okay your body is sufficient in iodine and so you don't need any more um, exogenous iodine and then if it's completely gone within 12 hours then you definitely need some iodine so yeah. that's a cool way to kind of test um that's something that i do on my clients just gonna say it's like you know we have to kind of sometimes unnatural environmental conditions can require unnatural interventions and we have to kind of keep on our toes you know we're in a very toxic world as you know and so yeah. you know there's these onslaughts from all sides at the moment and it's very much we kind of just have to do our best and and you know uh try to monitor our health status in various ways and and do what we can right no i absolutely agree um so with all this said like what do you eat typically in a day right okay so i tend to cycle right so i will go kind of periods generally in the winter time i'll go periods of very deep ketogenesis or carnival um and then i i also like to push my body right so i am in i would say currently where i am i've got relatively okay metabolic flexibility so i can quite easily burn carbohydrate for energy so you know i don't shy away from carbs necessarily like uh for instance this winter time i mean i've been primarily carnivorous for bar kind of two months ago i was mm -hmm. mostly meat liver um, I like kind of bone broths. I'm not a fan of bone marrow. I can't quite get my head around it, but I like to drink it. I can't okay. eat it yet. Um, yeah, generally fatty beef, fatty lamb. I eat a lot of fatty beef, fatty lamb. I do eat some pork. I tend to get, I tend to do better on pork. I don't really eat any greens. Don't eat any chocolate. What I do like, I do like some egg yolks. Um, but if I eat too many of them, then I find that they tend not to agree with me that much i've always had a bit of an allergy against egg whites so i am quite sensitive to eggs um i eat a little bit of goat's cheese um and some kind of fermented or raw cheeses uh mm -hmm. but very little uh i've these past two months i've been having some more potato 
Um, but other than that, I don't really eat many plants. It's primarily animals. Uh, I like the old can of sardines. So I generally have like a can of sardines maybe three or four times a week. Um, and sometimes I will get cravings for vegetables or fruit. So actually I will kind of just get a ravenous craving for like a head of broccoli for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why that is, but I like to listen to my body. You know, I don't like to be very set and because I don't have any ongoing health condition, you know, if I get a craving for broccoli, I'm going to eat some broccoli. Um, but generally that will just be kind of steamed or, you know, um, if I want some fruit, generally I tend to eat fruit, a little bit more fruit in the, uh, in the kind of summertime when it's seasonal. So I might eat some berries or I might, you know, eat some apples for instance generally 90 percent of my calories will be coming from animal food so what about you no that makes sense um i for the most part i'm pretty much strict carnivore i just do better with that um i have kind of like the black and white thinking so when i open the doors for with a little bit of carbs i notice that i keep kind of dipping my toes into it until i fully go for all these carbs and so I've just um, done better um, in terms of mental health with just going full meat-based. When you know you feel better on a certain way of eating, you just kind of stay that way. And for me, uh, just eating carnivore has helped a lot. So that's why I stick to it. It's not necessarily that my physical body um, can't handle plants. Yeah, in in certain people, you know, any amount of carbs can really just kind of open the door, as you said. And I, I don't know whether there's some kind of genetic predisposition whether i don't know what what is governing that but some people my other half any any sugar any fruit any carbohydrate and it's like it just sends her down the path of kind of pigging out on it so she is just primarily carnivore and she's great on it she's fantastic on it for me you know i can be a bit more flexible but yeah it's it's individual right and maybe that will change for you as well maybe there'll be a time when you feel a craving for something and you know as long as kind of you trust your body and but then again you know the craving will also be sugar as well so right so i mean you know there's a ton of studies where they show sugar is addictive um and you know when it comes to plants i think right now it's the mindset of well only the animal kingdom and so when you open the plants it's also opens the nuts and then opens the sugar right so i would love to get to a place where um i can eat the i guess the most innocuous plants and all that but you know i've tried um adding a little bit of kimchi and then it over time right because it's like the fermented good for your prebiotics that type of thing and then it slowly you know added a little bit more and more and so um you know i trust that one day i can get there but for now it's like working so you know why why fix something that's not broke kind of thing yeah right? exactly so, exactly um, yeah and i i do think there's a little bit of a genetic component i think you're kind of um so gretchen rubin has this book where she talks about personality types of moderators versus abstainers so some people do really well moderating it sounds like you're a moderator um my husband's a moderator so when he tried to do carnivore and made him go insane uh he, he was physically feeling great but the fact that he could not touch an apple or something was making him crazy. He's one of those people that can have like a chocolate bar and they'll sit there for months. He can have like one piece at a time and it's completely fine. Um, and then there's the abstainers, which is more like a personality like mine, where it's the one percent of one percent um, accessibility makes it much more diff- difficult than having zero percent access accessibility. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, And so it's really kind of the balance of nutrition, but also getting to know yourself and seeing what works for you and your kind of, and obviously it always goes back to bio-individuality. All right, guys, I hope you guys learned a lot about oxalates and I hope you guys have a better understanding of how nutrition works in our bodies and it's not just a simple fix. I hope you guys understand all the benefits of going meat-based, but how supplements do have a place Um, that can benefit you. All right, guys, you know the drill. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys soon. Bye. Take care.